Hi, and welcome to Stardo, the show for the American entrepreneur. I'm Chris Franks alongside Sandy Grayson. Before we get started today, special shout out and thanks goes to Axles for providing us these cool hats, these cool clothes. You're not wearing your Axles gear today, Sandy? It's very cold. It is very cold. I have my Axle <laughs> shirt on underneath, but it is incredibly cold here in Denver, Colorado today. And our studio is kind of chilly. It is a little bit chilly. So today's show, we asked the question, what happens when innovation, startup innovation, crashes into government regulation. Every presidential candidate and president says they want to be startup friendly, but too often entrepreneurs find themselves wrapped in a government red tape. To help us answer this question, we have a special guest, my friend, believe it or not, my landlord, <laughs> the founder and CEO of Number 8 Brands, Lance Little. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing very well, thanks. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about Number 8. Um, so Number 8 is a, uh, a toy distributor and manufacturer. So we uh, distribute brands for other small companies and we also manufacture our own products. You basically have the job that both of my boys dream of. Um, I would imagine so. Yeah, so when I come into the <laughs> office and I tell them they can't touch anything, they get really pissed off. You get to just play with toys. And play with toys all That's day awesome. long. Well, Lance, thanks for joining us. We're going to have a good conversation today, so let's dive right in. So, did you guys see this article in the New York Times last week? A feisty startup is met with a regulatory snarl. It's about our good friends from Uber. And apparently, they've been running into quite a bit of legislative government regulation problems. So, I called up um, the GM of Uber in Washington, D.C., Rachel Holt, and we did a quick talk this morning to see what is happening. Hey, Rachel, thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate you hanging out in the Stardo warehouse with me. <laughs> Absolutely, cool. I'm excited to be here. So I just wanted to grab a couple of quotes from you because um, today's show is all about startup innovations and how they sometimes crash into government regulations. And Uber has been kind of at the center of some really interesting legislation that's going on. I read this article in the New York Times, I think it was December 2nd. Um, and it was funny when I read it, it was like the first page was really hard on Uber. And then by the time I got to the second page and they were quoting your um, founder, I was like, oh, I get it. So it's like this clash between the guys that want to keep everything exactly the way it is and someone like Uber and some other apps as well that are really being very innovative um, in transportation. But transportation is kind of an old industry, right? <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. I think one of the things uh, that we've certainly learned quickly is that uh, the laws don't always catch up to innovation uh, you know, quite as quickly as we'd like. And uh, it's certainly something where, uh, you know, as companies continue, as tech companies particularly continue to get into spaces like transportation, like hotels, um, it, it's gonna, there are going to be more and more of these uh, issues, I well, think, so coming up. So as the general manager of Uber in D.C., which is really in the heart of a lot of legislation that they're proposing, can you tell us, like, the latest? And I'd like, I'd like you to answer two things. One is, what is it like being the general manager of a startup that's kind of at the center of a lot of government stuff? And also, what's the latest update? Like, how, how's it going to turn out, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can certainly say that when uh, when I took this role, I didn't think that uh, this was going to be quite as big a part of my job as it turns out it is. Um, but I, but ultimately, um, where we are right now in D.C. is actually uh, in a great spot. So over the course of, of actually almost the last year, we've been going back and forth with regulators and legislators around, um, you know, this is something that they had never conceived of. And um, these laws were created before the iPhone, before Google Maps, before right. GPS even was was invented. And so, um, you know, one of the things I think we've been trying to push and educate them on is is just because a law doesn't exist to address something um, doesn't mean it's illegal. Um, and I think that's you know that's been one of the fundamental um, challenges uh, that we've had. But ultimately, in D.C., we've really gotten to um, a great spot. So we had legislation that was passed uh, actually a week ago today. Uh, which uh, really validates uh, Uber's business model and removes any level of ambiguity around whether or not um, you know the legislators in DC want Uber there for the long haul. And uh, you know we were really excited by the outcome. And and frankly, I hope that other cities take the lead of DC and uh, and start looking at passing similar legislation. So the legislation as well. did pass that I was reading about. 
It great. did, yes. That's which is great really news great. For us. We love Uber here in Colorado. They've given me rides a couple times when it was snowing and I didn't want to drive. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to wear my nice shoes, so they like picked me up at the door. We have we have fewer of the snow stories in DC, but we have uh, we have the equivalent. That's awesome. So, do you have any advice that you would pass along to some startups out there that might have built some amazing technology, and then all of a sudden they run right into the brick wall that can be government regulation? Absolutely. Well, I think ultimately one of the reasons we've been so successful here in DC is that we had a extremely vocal consumer base who loved our product and was unwilling um, to let the folks they elected um, put us out of business. And I think, you know, it, it's really, um, I think we, we've been really lucky that we have a, frankly, a, a consumer focused product, right? I could imagine if you were in a business to business uh, product that this would be a, a much bigger challenge. But we ultimately um, had you know, tens of thousands of advocates here in D.C. who are doing, um, you know, the lobbying, so to speak, for us. Um, and I think when when we were lucky, we do have a set of, of legislators here that really do listen to their constituents. Um, and ultimately, I think that's why we, we've been so successful. That's awesome. Cool. I guess my final question is, is there anything that we can do here in Colorado or startups across America? What can we do to support Uber and to support more amazing innovation that's happening out there? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that really excited us about what happened in D.C. is is we now have a model, right? We now have a model that um, has legislation that both, um, you know, folks in government are excited about and we're excited about. And I would say, you know, encourage um, encourage uh, legislators and regulators in your city to look at what D.C. did and think about as they're looking at new transportation regulations, you know, think about um, implementing ones that are similar. So, keep you know, keep the pressure on. Uh, local local officials and make sure they end up on the side Fantastic. of innovation. Thanks, Rachel. You're awesome. No problem. Thank you, Sandy. So, um, with all of this legislation still out there, Washington D.C. has been successful, but there's still there's still lawsuits on the books in California and Chicago and Massachusetts and New York. What do you guys think? I mean, is it just a case of the wild, wild west and anything goes? We've got um, the CEO of Uber that says the corruption of the taxi industry will make it so you'll never get to market. And then you've got the chairman of the New York Taxi and Limousine Commission saying that, you know, Uber is a rogue app and that they should be shut down or they should be regulated. What do you guys think? <laughs> what do you think, Lance? Well, you know, I personally think that uh, the transportation companies like the taxi companies and limousine companies, they need to adapt and innovate like every other industry. Isn't this just a case of a dinosaur trying to hold on to their little territory? Right. <laughs> and you've got a kick-ass company like Uber coming in, yeah. kicking the crap out of them, and they get pissed off. And so the only recourse they have is to cry to mama, <laughs> and which in this case happens to be city council. I mean, it clearly, it's, it's, I think it's ridiculous. Right. The thing that made me laugh was the guy, um, the chairman of the New York Taxi Limits, and he gets together with these other 15 representatives from city government, and they form a commission, and they call it the Smartphone Apps Committee. Which, can and I just they're comment? they're going to write up the guidelines. That might be the dumbest name of all time. <laughs> <laughs> and why do they get to decide? That's crazy. I'm going like, to, you know what? Congratulations. <laughs> I'm forming a super smartphone apps committee right this second. <laughs> you three are my co-founders. You guys, you guys are on board too. That's Bye. awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to decide what's awesome and what's not. And what's, a, what's legal. What's, what's completely legal. legal. That's we're right. Gonna and I'm going to take laws. this to, to the city council. And we're going to decide what's cool and what's legal. Well, I'm excited for Uber because I think they're an awesome company. And there's a lot of other smartphone apps out there that are coming along and really changing the way we live our lives. And I'm hoping that that technology just get, keeps getting passed and that, yeah, we, absolutely. that we can use it because it's cool. Yeah, it is very cool. I mean, my, my question for you, Lance, is, and I know it's not the same in the toy business, but I mean, is, is inherently government, particularly local government in this case, standing in the way, is it a roadblock to innovation? Because government tries to be, attempts to be, a source to promote innovation and promote startups. But it seems to me that everywhere they turn, they just stifle it. Am I, am I crazy or am I, am I on the right track? Yeah, I mean, one of the major roadblocks in the toy industry is all the testing regulations. But, you know, as uh, toys advance and as we progress, the, you know, I think a lot of that, those things are needed. Um, but, 
you know, if you don't innovate, you're left behind. And yeah. I think this is one of those cases. Um, I don't think there's as many regulations put forth from the government in the toy industry, but. Are you guys self-regulated more as, a, as an industry or do you guys? It, it's a pretty good mixture. It's a 50-50. Perhaps we should mention one of the reasons that we that you thought of Lance was because he has had a little bit of run-in with the government for a completely different reason. That's right. So uh, you might have noticed from his sexy accent. From, well, that's that's right. <laughs> so the startup world was all abuzz this week when the White House we got word that the White House revoked a promise that would essentially have moved ahead on a project called the startup visa. Startup visa would basically allow anyone who creates a company within the United States and hires U.S. citizens to have a visa. Now, what they effectively did was lump it in with aggressive immigration policy, including some of the most controversial pieces of, of legislation, which now, something that we could all agree on was a good idea, by giving entrepreneurs visas, have now been lumped in with things like path to citizenship and other mm -hmm. very, very controversial bills. So, Lance, Unlike uh, me, from, I'm from Texas, which is another foreign country. You are, you're not from Texas. Do you want to tell a little bit about your story? Yeah, I'm from New Zealand. Um, I was working in London for a British company. Uh, we wanted to bring that company to the US and uh, I, I did that in 2007 uh, on a business visa, which was a special, uh, you know, skilled migrant visa. If you're the head of a company and you're, you're wanting to bring the business in, you can come in for a, a period of six months. Mm -hmm. uh, that lasted for about a year and then uh, that got cut down to three months. And then uh, one time I went to Hong Kong, we had an office in Hong Kong at the time and I, I traveled to Hong Kong. I came back and I uh, got put in a little room and told, you know, I'm basically on the next plane out of here. You were no longer welcome. No longer welcome. Wow. So uh, I, I, I said straight up to the, uh, the customs officer, I said, fine, oh, I'm going to get on the phone. I'm going to fire all our staff um, and, you know, I'm going to try and arrange for my apartment to be, you know, cleared out. Uh, I'm sure all the four employees that we have that are all American citizens are really going to appreciate that decision. Um, and it's been a long road since then. Uh, I now have a, a visa because I'm married. But yeah, it was extremely difficult um, considering we were running a, you know, two, two and a half million dollar business. We employed four American citizens and we we're paying them a very decent salary. Uh, we also had a warehouse in Texas, which we would have probably had to close down. Another foreign country. Another foreign country. Uh, we, we didn't ha own the warehouse, but we had a fulfillment center there where, you know, our business um, directly allowed them to hire more staff. Um, so yeah, it was a, a nightmare, to and say so the, the least. the only reason you have a visa now is because you got married, not because you were able to... That's right. I, I did apply for a more permanent business visa, um, and I spent a, a pretty large sum of money doing that and was still denied. Um, and I, I ended up staying for about six months illegally, uh, and then I was married and I... No, it's actually, it's fine now that I'm married. I, I, did, I did make sure that was okay. And we should also mention if you look a little bit tired, not only are you married. I do have a new little baby. Very nice. Brand new Four baby. weeks, yeah. Four weeks. Uh, well, congratulations Thank on you. that. I, I want to read something to you guys, and it, it's very similar to your story because I think that the, the startup landscape's littered with stories like this. Uh, and I'm going to butcher the name, but it's Amit Aharoni, I think, is an Israeli national and graduate at Stanford Business School, secured $1.65 million in venture capital funding with two co-founders to launch CruiseWise.com, an online cruise booking company. Um, was named as one of the startups to watch in Silicon Valley, and frankly got kicked out of the country because his visa ran out. So immediately after receiving his letter, Aroni left for Vancouver where he now tries to guide his company from a friend's living room. Mm -hmm. He says he uh, believes in San Francisco headquarters business could create hundreds of jobs in the next five years and that plan is now in jeopardy. He goes on to say that essentially, if he can't fix this problem, he's going to move his entire company to Vancouver, Canada. You had a choice. When you came to the U.S., you created number eight brands in the U.S., maybe because uh, of Amanda, your wife, but there was other places you could go. We're under this sort of illusion in the U.S. that we're just such a great place to start companies, and there is no competition worldwide, which is simply not true, right? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I picked the U.S. because there was a lot of opportunities for the company um, and bigger opportunities to hire a lot more people than I could have done in, in any other country. But that America is not the only option for us uh, or any 
entrepreneur startup. And it's not very welcoming. I mean, as Brad felt said in that in that post, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, the company, our, our country that was founded on liberty and justice for all, that it's so difficult for someone who wants to bring jobs and money right. and, and an exciting new company to mm -hmm. the U.S. that it's so difficult. Um, one of the comments on, on Brad's blog, and, and I want you to read that full quote in just a second. One of the comments on Brad's blog was from a guy named JT who had said he had two startups and shut them down. Your story, uh, the story of Aharoni, um, the story of JT, are we as a country effectively pulling away the welcome mat for entrepreneurs? And what does that not only say about our short-term prospects for starting companies and becoming the center of entrepreneurship, but what about our long-term prospects? Lance. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely think, you know, ha me having told a lot of people my story would, um, you know, they would question whether they wanted to bring a company and start it up in the U.S. So the long-term effect is, you know, is it going to be obviously negative because no one's going to want to bring their business to the U.S. if they run into problems like I ran into. Um, it makes me kind of sad, you know, because, I mean, I will be the first to admit I'm not that well-versed on immigration policy and I'm one of those people that's like, you know, come one, come all, it's, you know, it's the melting pot. That's right. how America was founded. Right. And, and it, it makes me sad that, that it's not easier. And, and especially living in a community like Boulder and Denver where there's so much cool technology and you just see these amazing, brilliant people. I don't care if they're from Texas or Boulder <laughs> or New Zealand. You might care like, if they're from Texas, be honest. <laughs> but yeah. you are kind of difficult. I am difficult, but, but yeah. the, uh, I think that it speaks to something that is just very, very fundamental to what our country is about. Are we going to, in a time of economic recession, in a time where, or, or moderate growth, in a time where you have people that are going through pretty substantial amounts of pain mm -hmm. to start a company in the U.S. and hire, how many Americans were you employing at the time? Four. Four? You know, not, not, that doesn't include the warehouse staff and, you know, we had... The indirect impact. Yeah, we, you know, we indirectly hired 80 sales reps um, who, mm -hmm. you know, sold all of our products that they wouldn't be able to sell if we weren't here. Yeah. And so we essentially said, thank you, but no thank you. Right. Um, which is, uh, I think it's unconscionable. I literally, I could probably tell I'm fairly passionate about the subject. I think it's idiocy. Uh, if you b join me in that belief, um, startupvisa.com, you can find Startup Visa uh, on Facebook and on Twitter. And as we found out, having people yell about this and call what is idiocy, idiocy, mm -hmm. the fact that we can't get a piece of legislation passed when in, in, in everybody believes that in that particular case, we should have had the President of the United States hand you a visa on a silver platter and say thank you very much for your Absolutely. investment in the country. Um, so yeah, that is, we're running out of time. Sandy, where can people find us? You can check out our Twitter page, which is Starto TV. You can find us on Facebook at Starto TV. And make sure you check out our website, which will have the video blog and lots of links to all the, the articles that we read to prepare for the show on icosa.co. Uh, Lance, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you for Lance. putting up with me and, and allowing me to live in your back room. Is he a good tenant or a bad tenant? You know, he's never there, so he's a perfect <laughs> well, tenant. always here at the studio, so yeah, I'm never there. I'm a perfect, that's exactly, that's like the best yeah. roommate in college. At least now I know that you are somewhere there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah not, I'm not. He's not you. playing golf or skiing. Yeah. He's doing support. I would, I would rather be doing those things, but that's, <laughs> that is all the time we have for today's show. Join us again next week for Stardo, the show for the American entrepreneur.